probably the most young civil rights attorney, Thurgood Marshall, was a case called Brown versus the Board of Education. Uh, see, public schools were segregated. Blacks and whites couldn't learn together. Marshall argued that the only way that the Supreme Court could uphold this unfair law was to prove that blacks were inferior to whites. Deliberations dragged on and on as the nation waited. Finally, the courts announced that they were going to read their decision. Well, reporters and spectators crowded into the, into the courtroom. It seemed like it was going to take Chief Justice Warren forever to get to the point. Finally, he said, we have concluded. And then he paused for significant effect. Unanimously, that the doctrine of separate but equal has no place in public education. Separate facilities are inherently unequal. Thurgood Marshall felt like he'd, he'd hit, the, hit a grand slam, clearing the way for, for the desegregation of all public facilities in America. Thurgood Marshall graduated from high school in 1925, determined to continue his education. He chose Lincoln University, the nation's oldest black college. There he met Vivian Bury, a University of Pennsylvania undergraduate. The two students fell in love almost immediately. Marshall and Bury, both 21 years old, were married on September 4, 1929. Marshall next turned to Howard University's law school, which accepted his application. Up every day at 5.30 a.m., he caught a train to Washington, attended classes until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, boarded the return train to Baltimore, and then reported for his part-time job. Thurgood Marshall came out of a tradition of the Howard University Law School in which it um, placed itself as, in essence, the West Point of the Civil Rights Movement in producing those lawyers who would be the field generals in the battles, in the court battles, uh, which resulted in striking down uh, a whole host of um, restrictive covenants in housing, uh, segregation, and many of the other things which um, presaged uh, the modern Civil Rights Movement, which started with the Montgomery bus, bu bus boycott. Marshall's hard work paid off. At the end of his first year, he was named top student in his class an achievement that brought him the coveted job of assistant in Howard's Law Library. In 1933, he graduated first in his class. In 1934, Marshall and the NAACP led a boycott of stores on Baltimore's Pennsylvania Avenue. Although they depended on black customers, the white owners of these shops flatly refused to hire any black workers. The boycott succeeded, but shopkeepers sued the NAACP. Marshall's Howard University mentor, Charles Houston, joined his protege in defending the suit. The two lawyers worked as a team. The judge not only ruled in favor of the NAACP, but congratulated Marshall and Houston on their effective presentation. For the next two years, Marshall worked as Houston's assistant and they spent much of their time traveling from one southern courthouse to another as they filed lawsuits for black students and teachers. Uh, black teachers might have 60 students in a class and made $1,000 a year. White teachers would have 20 students in a class and make $3,000 a year. And it just wasn't fair. And I heard Thurgood Marshall plead that case when I was about 10 years old. Uh, and. Um, I don't remember what he said, but I never will forget this tall, handsome man, a uh, good-looking man, getting up with no notes, hole in the court, spellbound, citing cases, and, uh, and winning. In late 1938, Charles Houston resigned as NAACP special counsel because of ill health. Marshall. 30 years old, replaced him. With his wife, he moved into a walk-up apartment in Harlem and took over Houston's desk. Houston was a mentor 
of Marshall, encouraged Marshall to go into the activities that he did, supported Marshall's moving to the NAACP and becoming a lead attorney on innumerable cases which led to the successes uh, that the Civil Rights Movement was able to achieve in the courts in the United States. As chief counsel to the important civil rights organization, Marshall had become black America's most prominent attorney. Marshall next moved to the crucial area of voting rights. The 15th Amendment, ratified in 1870, gave black men the right to vote. Still another means, perhaps the most effective, of preventing blacks from voting was the white primary. In order to maintain control uh, of the government, uh, the Democrats separated their party, uh, made sure that no blacks could participate in it. Uh, the way they did that was to exclude African Americans from the primary system. The primaries were the only place where it made a difference whether you voted or not. And so by maintaining a white primary, uh, the Democrats effectively excluded African Americans from effective participation in voting. In 1944, Marshall attacked the white primary, starting in Texas. When black Texan Lonnie Smith tried to vote in the Texas primary election, he was turned away. He filed suit, but it was dismissed. Marshall took the case to the Supreme Court, and with only one dissenting vote, the court favored Marshall, making discrimination in primary elections illegal. Marshall went on to win another case, ruling segregation illegal on interstate buses. Thurgood Marshall's next major case was Briggs versus Elliott. Marshall's argument was that black schools were unequal to white schools and that they could never be equal unless they were integrated. It was important to challenge the idea of separate but equal for both reasons. First, to m try to get the facilities better, uh, to upgrade them so that they really were equal, but more important to uh, get rid of the idea that whites were superior to blacks and therefore were entitled not to associate with them. Marshall lost the case. After a series of delays, the Supreme Court finally agreed to hear the Briggs case, along with four other NAACP segregation suits. Titled Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, the consolidated appeals went before the Supreme Court on December 9, 1952. After three days of intense arguments, the Supreme Court justices retired to consider what they had heard. A Southern lawyer came very close to saying to the justices, you can't order us to desegregate because we won't comply. Marshall got up right after that and was incredibly indignant. He said, this is the Constitution. The Supreme Court says what the Constitution means. We have to believe that the people in the country will comply with it. Uh, and uh, the power of his commitment to the Constitution came through more clearly in that argument than in anything I've seen. Five months later, they unanimously declared school segregation unconstitutional. For Thurgood Marshall, the decision crowned half a lifetime of dedicated labor. His happiness, however, was soon shadowed by sorrow. Shortly after the decision, Vivian Marshall told her husband she was dying of cancer. Vivian Marshall died in February 1955. Within the year, the 47-year-old Marshall began courting Hawaiian-born Cecilia Suyet. They married in December 1955. In February 1956, Marshall called a meeting of Southern civil rights lawyers in Atlanta, Georgia. After hearing reports on the lack of progress in local school integration, he called for ongoing pressure on a case-by-case -case basis. The lawsuits that followed inspired not only complex legal maneuvering, but hostility, boycotts, and sometimes rioting that required armed intervention. By far, the most violent resistance to integration took place in Little Rock, Arkansas. The school board had prepared to admit black students to the city's Central High School in the fall of 1957. 